The issue of broadband infrastructure is essential. Some of you are going to be familiar with Kevin Kelly, who lives out in Pacifica, started Wired Magazine. He wrote a really, he's written a number of books that are worth reading. One in particular is on networks. He wrote it in 1990, I think it was published in 98. Um, it's called New Rules for the New Economy. And it's still, you know, he talks about CD-ROMs in there, and so not all of it's current, but a surprising amount of it is. Um, it's an e-book, so you can read it at no cost. Um, and this is one of his main themes in this book, is that communication, you know, we're used to saying it's a digital economy. Um, it really is a communication economy, and so that really underscores the point of the infrastructure and the things that happen across the infrastructure are really important in our economy. And, and so we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, some will call it the fourth utility. I'm not going to go as far as saying it's as important as water. Um, water's more important than broadband infrastructure, but uh, I think for, from an economic development point of view, broadband is essential in our lives, right? It's, it, if its function is different than the sewer system or the electrical grid, but enable to, to enable us to move around in the economy, the infrastructure is essential. And yet we've inherited a system, so primarily big cable, big telco, they had infrastructure in the ground as the internet emerged. And what probably seemed like a threat to them initially um, soon became an opportunity. And they've done a very effective job at essentially seizing, using their infrastructure, what they had on the wires and in the ground, to become the foundation of the internet in this country and in many others. That evolution is not, if you look at it, it wasn't an evolution of how should this work. It was an evolution of how do we make this work on our infrastructure and control it, right? And they've effectively done that uh, nationwide. They, the, big, the big telcos, big cable, essentially controls this infrastructure. And still today, it's not a question of how should this work. It's a question of how do we build the business model we want around the infrastructure? How do we use the infrastructure? And the way I translate it is, how do we use the infrastructure to protect ourselves from competition? And how do we use the infrastructure to protect ourselves from somebody else's innovation? So those two things. Um, so. More and more, this is referred to as the fourth utility. As we look at what's coming, um, and it's, it's hard to know what's coming, but if we're paying attention to where money's flowing and to the kinds of investments that um, are getting a lot of venture capital attention, everything's going on demand real time, and automation is a, is a recurring theme. Distributed ledger or blockchain, you know, some people believe that in the next 10 years we'll see the rise of the blockchain and, and some in the next five years where it'll fundamentally change the way we think about banks and third-party institutions to handle our money. Um, anything that's a trusted broker relationship, uh, there are a lot of folks that believe blockchain is going to rearrange all of that. Um, artificial intelligence, um, there are artificial intelligence skeptics out there. There's a lot of artificial intelligence believers. Um, the skeptics think that it's going to do a lot of uh, somewhat straightforward things, but they stop at the point where, the, where people start talking about it surpassing human intelligence. That's where the skeptics come in. But regardless, I think artificial intelligence is going to um, play an increasing role in the economy. And then the Internet of Things, 
The idea's been out for seven, eight years, maybe 10. And, and everything that's happening is happening sort of in the background. It's not, you know, we do have Nest thermostats and there are some things that are getting traction, but we're really at the beginning of what I would say is the, any substantial movement with IoT. But I do think it is, it's real. And so the point of all of this is, are our networks designed and prepared to support whatever's coming? So if you back up and think, they're not designed strategically to enable the customer, they're designed strategically to enable a business plan that maximizes profit, then it's easy to jump to a, a conclusion the network is not strategically positioned for the future, it's strategically positioned for a business plan. And, and one of our arguments is we need networks that will evolve, networks that will support wherever the economy evolves. <clears throat> you know, I think some portion of your county is still DSL. Is that an accurate assumption? So case in point, di really dial it? <laughs> um, so case in point, right? That's not, why would that be? You know, there's not a business model. They're not thinking of what does the customer need. They're thinking, you know, how does this fit in our algorithm for profitability? And if it doesn't fit, the infrastructure is not happening. So back up and say, is the infrastructure really essential? If it's essential, then we've got to start thinking about it more like a utility. You know, we can argue about the open nature of the internet. I think there are, there are strong claims that some of the dominant companies have such a position of strength that systems function as closed systems as opposed to open systems. But there, the internet is a place where we can go and innovate and put our, our ideas out there. Whether they get adoption is another issue, but it is a place where we're free to innovate and free to throw our innovation out to the public. The way we access the internet is not open in that way. Because these companies control the infrastructure, they effectively keep everybody out of their space, right? It's the infrastructure that protects them. And once you remove the infrastructure, their business model becomes very vulnerable, okay? We're used to thinking about, well, they, you know, in your area, you probably have two. You probably have Comcast and AT&T primarily, right? Is that accurate? And then some, some WISPs, wireless ISPs. Um, so there's not really a marketplace for ISPs. And you peel it back, and the real reason there is not a marketplace is those ISPs own the infrastructure, so it is protecting them. And the, the real kicker is that people don't think about is the, is the lack of innovation that can happen to thwart their business model. So a key idea here is once you remove the infrastructure from them, their business model becomes very vulnerable. And it hasn't been tried in very many places, but once you do, stuff can start to move around. So our argument is we want a system that's open to innovation and open to competition edge to edge. Okay, so in the access space, we want an open system, and the internet itself, we want open systems. And by open, part of what we mean, a big part of what we mean is open to competition, open to innovation. So we look at it as three layers. Um, there's the infrastructure layer, there's the access layer, the way we get on the infrastructure or the way we access services, and then there's the internet itself where we'll we go get access services. In the current model, the internet is an open system, again going back to our definition, but the access and the infrastructure are closed systems, okay? People are not able to go onto those systems and offer an alternative, either infrastructure or, you can't do things with the infrastructure that make it open. Okay? It's not exposed and available. It's closed and access to it is also closed. In our model, 
what we're pushing is open at all three layers. Okay? And it doesn't, at the infrastructure layer, that doesn't mean it's radically open. You can go and do whatever you want. What it means is that once the infrastructure is put in, you want a lot, the community wants a lot to happen across that infrastructure as much as possible. And so the infrastructure becomes the, a utility that's available to be used by the residents of the community as long as it's not malicious, the way, that, the, way the use happens, okay? So that fundamentally the way to think about the differences in the model are we're trying to make the whole thing open and it's closed in these two ways. This is sort of rhetorical, um, who should network serve? We think that ultimately networks are going to serve subscribers. That over the long arc, we're going to get to a position where networks serve subscribers. Today, because the operators control the infrastructure and access to it, they've got so much power, it's just too tempting. I mean, nobody can stop that model unless you replace the infrastructure. So there's too much concentration of power. So the problem fundamentally is a, is a control issue. Who has control? So our belief is that once you separate control, once you take the infrastructure away from them, and you don't go take their infrastructure, you build new fiber optic infrastructure, then a lot of evolution can happen. A lot can change in what the systems are capable of doing. And the way those systems get used in a community. So this idea of separating the infrastructure and the services, you know, we're used to, because they're commingled today and because all of the history we know is a history where there's no distinction between the infrastructure and the service. The same company owns it and, and people just aren't used to creating that separation in their minds. This is first a technology problem. How do you create the separation? And then secondly, how do you help people to think about the network in the three layers? Where infrastructure is one thing I pay for, then I pay for access to the network, and then I go out and, and consume services. So um, if this is sort of, I gave a TED talk I think three years ago now, and this slide was in it, so this is sort of the main metaphor we've used to talk about open, it, open versus a closed infrastructure. This is the way our system works today. And to understand this, you have to understand that in this slide, UPS has their own road, UPS has their own road, and nobody else drives on this road. And that's what's happening with our networks, right? And it, you know, we would never do this. We couldn't physically achieve it with a road system, and we should stop achieving it with, a, with our digital roads. We should go to one robust road and then have that road open to traffic. Doesn't mean there can't be rules on the road. There should be rules, but it should be open, and we should try and figure out as many ways to use that infrastructure as is beneficial to, to individuals and to businesses. So let's see if this will work. I want to play. So what this is, is a, um, just a little video of how our system works. So it's all in the cloud. Services are in the cloud. So you go out, you find out what you want, you click subscribe, you go through the legal stuff, and then once you hit subscribe, a network is being provisioned. So what that means is a connection to an ISP is being made. So the way to think about it is if, if this city or this county did it, I'm going to pause this. Whoops. Let me go back. If this city or county did it, the, there would be a place, a, a, essentially a, a server room or a data center where ISPs would come and have a presence and where the county would manage the network. And when you hit subscribe, what's going to happen is, is we're not going to physically unplug a port and plug it into that ISP. 
They're are, they already have a presence on the network and it happens automatically, okay? So when you click subscribe to an ISP, within 30 seconds, you'll be provisioned with automation to that ISP. And then if you hit unsubscribe, you'll, that network connection will be torn down, there won't be a connection, and then you can go subscribe to a new one. So subscribing and unsubscribing is dynamic, what we're used to on the internet, but now it's happening with an ISP. So everybody essentially think of it as a meeting place. That, that server room is a place where everybody meets. And so the county, it's their server room or their data center. The ISPs have a presence in that data center. So they've got a device there which gives them a presence there. What our software does, so we view it that we've got three stakeholders. We've got you, the customer, whether you're a business or a resident. There's the network operator and there's the, serv the ISP. What our software does is automates the interaction of the three. Uh, you're sitting up in uh, Grass Valley somewhere. Yeah. How do you connect to that network? So you're saying your home is in Grass Valley. How do you connect? Yes. Yeah. So that's the hard part. A new network has to be built. Fiber optic network throughout, whether it's the city or the county, a new network has to be built. Why would you do that if you have, you have an infrastructure already it's just who owns it. So the reason you would do that is because the network is owned by private um, parties, private businesses, and they're not open, so you can't use them. Now, you could, through legislation, um, have Title II start to regulate the Internet, and then it would be open, but that's probably not going to happen anytime soon. So you have to build a new physical, publicly owned fiber optic network. Why do that when there's plenty of fiber around? The question what, is, what, uh, what who fiber, owns it? What fiber's around? There's, fi there's fiber uh, all, all around uh, in Grass Valley. Is it attached to your house? What? Is it attached to your house? I know. I, I, that's, that's the last mile. That's the, that's the part that we're talking it, about. You're not going to lay fiber for every uh, house. Do you have a driveway to your house? Yeah, I okay, heard. right. So what I'm saying is that's the same thing. You have to get the fiber to your house, and it's publicly owned. Right now, I just have a wireless, microwave wireless. Yeah. It's <laughs> a lot cheaper. Right? I will tell you, 20 years from now, I believe 99% of homes in the U.S. will have fiber in the next 20 years. And the reason I think that, right now it's happening in Europe, where the big private equity money is flowing in, is, you go look at it on the UK, big, like billions of dollars is flowing into the UK to build fiber to everybody in the country. That's already happening in Europe and that's coming to the US. You're gonna start to see in the next two to three years, billion dollar funds created to deploy fiber optics everywhere. Our model got replicated throughout much of the world, right? So British Telecom, was the dominant provider throughout the UK. Goldman Sachs put two and a half billion dollars last year into a company called City Fiber. And they went to the tier two cities throughout the UK. They're gonna build out five million customers with that two and a half billion dollars that Goldman provided to connect every home to fiber. And so, and it's a direct, um, you know, it's a direct competitive response to British Telecom, is really what it is. And they're, they're coming in. Now, this is the part that might win you over. You're saying, why would we do that when we have all the fiber? I'll give you two reasons, besides the ones that Michael gave you. Lower cost, faster speed. So this is, brings up a thing that's been running through my head this, this whole time you've been talking, which is is there much ability to increase the capacity of what you called WISPs, the wireless internet service providers, to deliver not just the last mile, but the last five, the last 10 miles? Yeah. So um, wireless is getting better all the time, but the fundamental rule I use is wireless works best the faster it gets to fiber. 
The faster wireless gets to fiber, the better it works. So, 5G, go ahead. The fewer hops to fiber. Hold it, hold it a second. Yeah. We're going to mic you up. So if I understand you correctly, the fewer hops to fiber, the better wireless gets. So what I'm hearing is that, is that replacing the infrastructure now or adding new infrastructure is better than electing Bernie Sam Sanders to rip it out of the hands of those that have it now because those networks are not as fast as what you're proposing be installed. Okay. Yeah. Cable is coax, and they're get, they're increasing the capacity of coax, but it's still not even close to fiber. It's not. Even, I mean, we cannot see the horizon of capacity for fiber. In, in lab environments, they're doing five million megabits a second. Okay. And a lot of you, if you, how many of you have, how many of you have a gig connection? One of you has gig. Is it gig symmetrical or is it just gig down? It's asymmetrical. How many of you have 250 meg? So, not bad. And then how many have 100 meg? Okay. So, 2.6? Yeah. We got 10. There's 250 here. Yeah. In the, in the towns, right? No, 250 in this building. In the building, okay. Okay. There's a gigabyte box. That's like having five, the words 5G on your phone. There's just nothing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So fiber, you know, the standard we work with when we work with cities is everybody gets a gig pipe and it's symmetrical. Gig up, gig down. And that's the standard. And, we'll, and, I, and we can go into, now this is not true in rural, but we can go into any city in America. We think we can drop the price 25% and give you a gig symmetrical network in almost any city in America. Not San Francisco, not Seattle, not LA, just because the regulatory environment and the, just the complexity of those environments. But go out into any tier two, tier three city in America, we think we can drop the price. First through competition. Go ahead. Google tried that in Kansas City. Yeah. They had their uh, big contest to, uh, uh, you know, get to be a Google. Uh, what was Google's? What was Google's innovation? They were laying fiber. Well, they were laying fiber, but that wasn't an innovation. Other people were doing that. What was their innovation? What did they? What was the new, remarkable? What was the breakthrough they they delivered in Kansas City? They had no breakthrough. Exactly. <laughs> what, what's the breakthrough you guys have? It's the same. You can switch your ISP in 30 seconds. So, so think about this. Think about this. Think about the implications. If you can change your ISP in 30 seconds, if I can lower the barriers to entry so that any tech company in this county can become an ISP with less than a $3,000 investment and less than two days of work, What's going to happen? You're going to get competition. What's that? You're going to get a lot of ISPs. So we'll come back and answer that as we look at some financial. You know, I don't mind your skepticism, but let, let's look at what actually happens when you create competition. So two things, two innovations. So I'll go back to Google. I believe that if Google had stayed a software company, if they had just not tried to become a construction company, and if they didn't start in, they should have perfected their model in a town this size. They should have done some innovation and perfecting it at the town this size, then work their way up the stack. I think they would have been very successful. I think they would have probably taken over the country. But they started in really big cities, they relied on their brand, so their only offering to their customer was their brand, which was a good brand, but it wasn't enough because their competitors responded by dropping their price. I mean, that's what happened, right? No, the cost of actually laying the fiber was prohibitive. 
Well, they've successfully stayed in the seven cities they're in. They're in my city. They, they service an apartment I own, and they're, they're doing well. They get, they get a lot of market share in that city. So, they, I mean, they haven't, they haven't stopped doing they Google Fiber. Yeah. They certainly are not. They're not growing it. And I would say, yeah, the reason is there was no innovation, right? If there was an innovation and a compelling value proposition, but they copied the model. Was there a comment? I'm sorry, guys. No, you're good. I like the questions. So it, it comes again to, OK, we can swap our ISPs instantaneously, making them compete with each other. But in a town like this, we only have, let's say, Comcast and AT&T. Can you get a little bit into the nuts and bolts of how your company would connect those two different infrastructures to one? It would be using the. Uh, the long arc on this is once you make an ISP a software company, go back to what I said earlier about exposing them to innovation. Once an ISP becomes a software company and they have to compete against other software companies, we no longer, and they don't control the infrastructure, we're no longer stuck with a regional market. The marketplace becomes a national marketplace and innovation starts to happen, which really means automation starts to happen, okay? What does an ISP do that's so magical? What are they doing? Yeah, so they're, they're, they operate the infrastructure, they're giving you an IP address, and that's gonna get easier as we get to IPv6. Right now it's a scarce resource, but it won't be. And then they're giving us backhaul to, San, to Sacramento, in your case. Um, and then, you know, they provide customer service, but all that stuff's infrastructure related. Once you make them a software company, they're going to provide you an IP address, they're going to give you backhaul. Everything else they do can be automated. And so can those two things, okay? So it starts to fundamentally change the cost structures. And if you make it a national marketplace, their premium price starts to collapse. And we've got proof of this, okay? It's not just an idea, we've got proof of this. So, first thing, we wanna make access to the public internet radically open. The second thing we wanna do is not everything should be on the public internet. There's a lot of stuff that should not be on the public internet. But if a city builds out a network citywide, and you've got a node at every premise, what we're really doing is we're turning the city into a LAN, right? Or we can. we can. And we can start to do things at layer two or in private networks, okay? So we can, what that starts to look like over time is that you start to get, a, you've got the public internet, you start to get a private internet. Once you get enough people connected, it requires scale, and it requires people doing stuff on the network. But once you build out a city scale network, this whole new private internet emerges, or the possibility of one, okay? So those are the two things we're focused on. So private networks, um, they exist today. So if you own a business, if you had two business presences here in town, you could connect those two with what are known as private circuits. And those, you could go out through the World Wide Web, but you can also do a direct connection, a point to point. So you could connect through the web, but you could also do a point to point network. One of the cities we're working with has a private network connection between public works, water, police, city hall. Okay, so there's four, four buildings connected. They're paying $6,000 a month to connect those four buildings. They also paid for the construction. So they paid, to get, they paid to get the network in, and now they're paying fees of $6,000 a month just for that private network. So go back to when I said make the infrastructure open at the beginning. What we mean by that is you pay for your infrastructure, just like you pay for your sewer connection and your water connection. If you do that, I can give you a layer two connection and I can make it free. 
Okay? You pay for your infrastructure. You pay for that cost. Uh, we can finance it over 20 years or 25 years. But if you own your infrastructure, your connection to the network, we can start to do new things with the network in a business model that's not a, a grandchild of our current model. Okay? So <clears throat> that, that, that just means they're expensive. <laughs> So this is a statement by the National Science Foundation. Um, it says, we're at the dawn of a new era, software-defined infrastructure. This is two years ago. Uh, actually, three. It's February 2016. A starting point of a very deep revolution that will reshape the global computing infrastructure. Today's internet will run in just one slice across this infrastructure, with many other novel services populating other slices. Okay, so software-defined networking came out of Berkeley and Stanford in 2008. Might have been 2007. And, it, and where it's gone is into the data center, where Cisco controlled, they had their data plane and their intelligence on the switch. What software-defined networking did is it pulled the intelligence off the switch so that Cisco didn't control everything anymore. And that's where disruptions started to happen to their market. What we're doing is basically applying software-defined networking to a city. Okay, where right now it's, it's really just happening in a data center. We're, we're treating the city like a local area network. We're treating it like a LAN so that we can now do control the network with software there's still hardware in it, but it's a software-defined network. And, and so what that looks like, this is today's world. This is what it looks like as you get to software-defined infrastructure and virtualization. So virtualization means that we're creating software networks on the fly so you can build them up and tear them down on demand. So if you didn't want your Nest thermostat, to be across the public internet, you could deploy it in a private network. So that, that sort of thing starts to become possible. If you wanted to connect with each other, you wanted to send a large file, you wanted to send a gig file, you wouldn't have to use Dropbox, you could just use your layer two connection and it would take four seconds, okay? So lots of new things become possible. And it's, it's relevant for a city and what the city does in a community, it's relevant for utilities, it's relevant for just consumers. So the, the main point is not everything should happen across the public internet. We also need a private internet and we need to give people the tools to dynamically and automatically use that network. Just the way, that's what the internet is, right? Is that automation. So this, this little demonstration is how you can imagine this. So think of a doctor who wants to connect with a patient. So you go up to private LAN. I want to create a private network on the fly. It's going to ask you if you want to host the network or if you want to join the network. So the doctor would say, I want to host. Again, the legal stuff. And what it's going to do is give you a code. So the doctor could share this code with the patient. So the patient comes in, joins the network, puts in that code. And this is, this is all automated. And then the two are connected in a layer two network. Okay? They're connected in a private network. So this can happen human to human, human to machine, or machine to machine. So this kind of automation, if we wanted to connect, if you wanted to connect something that you controlled, it can be machine to machine. So if a water sensor senses water, turn off this valve. The network can do that, and we can build the network on the fly, okay? Just in terms of understanding what's possible with the automation. So um, a key thing on this private network is disruptive technologies typically will enable a new market to emerge. 
We think the big automation opportunity is at layer two, which means we think it's at private networking. We think certain things will happen with the public internet, like ISPs are gonna get moved to the cloud, but we think there's a whole bunch of innovation opportunities in the private network space. Yeah. I just want to be clear and understand what you're talking about, because it sounds like to me you're not talking about private light pipe running between the things. You're actually talking about a signal going down the same light pipe that the other private network is going down. Yeah, so you got most, so you're going down a public road, but but you're either doing an encryption or something so that it's. Yeah, just the VLAN, yeah. VLAN. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's not going out to the internet exchange point, right? Traffic's not crossing the public internet. So you're going to, at layer two, typically you're going to address at the MAC layer, or MAC addresses. Mm -hmm. okay. So is that for security reasons? Privacy, security, reliability. Those are the three reasons. So gamers would love this because it's a low latency network, right? So anything you want low latency, as we talk about autonomous vehicles moving around, those are not going to move across the public internet. Yeah, you do. Well, it depends on the application, right? Yeah. Uh, with if you're a private company with multiple locations, that right. makes a lot of sense. Hospitals, a doctor offices, that makes maybe, the, maybe not. So you get certain attributes with them. It doesn't mean it fixes the world, but you get, so for, first you get security by obscurity. Really hard for people to know that these networks exist. But it's still the service provider's responsibility. If that should be encrypted, it's still their responsibility to encrypt it. Yeah. But all those networks have multiple paths, so right. that's, that's the issue. Uh, but I'd love to get back to how do we build the local fiber network? Yeah. Because this is all great, yeah. but this is a stack of the ISP, and to me, that's the least value piece of the stack, and the higher value of the piece of the stack is the local fiber network. And that's the hardest thing for us to solve in our community. Great, yeah, it's one question and then we'll go to that. Can the private network, can the private network connect virtual entities? Yeah, um, so give me an example so I understand you correctly. Um, 3,500 websites across the country, all small business owners, all operating on a SaaS platform, sitting on the same server, but the websites are virtually all over the country. Get there. So right now we've got internet exchange points. When you leave your network, you hit an internet exchange point, which basically is a handoff to the next network. For this to work across a network domain, we have to have software-defined exchange points, which we will get there. We're just not there today. So you've got to have, it's got to become a standard that gets adopted, basically. So that standard has to replicate across the system. So conceptually, how many communities across the country are you in? Are we doing? Yes, are you, you currently have? Yeah, we're, so we've got three under construction. We're working with 18 in the planning to do construction. So we're very early. That's okay, this is the idea. So there's in the neighborhood of 20 right now. We concentrated our marketing in those 20 and we only built, we only signed up small businesses in those 20 communities. We could literally create a virtual network for customer support to work with the small business owners, for marketing consultants to work with the small business owners. That would be cool. I think what you're gonna see though, going back to my earlier comment, you're, you're gonna start to see big fund, infrastructure funds created. And so we've always felt, so there, there is a municipal broadband movement. So there's various cities, Chattanooga's done it, Google did it, um, Lafayette, Louisiana did it. And all these cities are tr experimenting basically. And we've always felt that the ultimate solution will be a technology solution, the one that wins. <clears throat> and it will say fiber is the base infrastructure. And when that happens, whenever that technology solution wins, we think it'll get replicated as rapidly as you can build out fiber networks. 
because big money is going to flow in from infrastructure funds and fiber is going to happen across the country. The only, the only exception is really rural areas where you know, the satellite systems that Elon Musk is working on will, yes. Why wouldn't I uh, use cellular and go uh, completely without laying fiber? Because I, I, my assumption is fiber is the most expensive way to hook a single location to, the, to give it internet access. Now, the, actually, the most expensive way is a monopoly, which is what you've got right now. The most expensive way to you, the consumer, is the way we're doing it today. And let me show you how. So I'll, I'm going to skip ahead to let me skip ahead to the way we do this. We can come back to this stuff if we have time. But go back to Kevin Kelly. In that book I told you about, he said the network economy rewards open systems. Closed systems close off opportunities. This is why the network economy routes around closed systems. And this is a big deal for us, this part in bold. The issue is whether it is easy or difficult for others to invent something that plays off your invention. So right now it's a closed system and it's really hard for people to invent on top of the Comcast system or on top of the AT&T system or name your, name your, it's really hard for anybody to do anything other than what they tell them they can do. So let's get into um, so let's get into the financing part of it. We can come back to this other stuff. So in how many how many homes are in your let's say just Nevada City? How many homes? How many what's the population? Fifteen mile radius, thirty thousand. Thirty thousand population. Yes. So about ten thousand premises. Yes. Okay. So the math here is nationwide the number is 70 bucks. Is that a relevant number? Is that what you guys are paying for internet? And what do you think? It's higher? What do you get for 70 bucks? Not much. I get six gigabytes down. Six gig or meg? A meg. Okay. And you're paying about 70 bucks? Yeah, and that's, that's on a good day. Okay, when your neighbors aren't. I got a fixed wireless system. Okay. When it's raining, for example, when it's cloudy, when it's snowing. They're, they're not having a problem with that. They're just having a problem with everything else. Back home. So. But, but the 70 bucks, is that right on? That's right on. OK, is that true for Comcast customers? Yeah. yeah. I get 250 for, for 70 bucks. OK. So, so you do the math, 10,000 premises right, roughly, in your community, everybody paying 70 bucks, okay, per month, times that by 12, times that by 20, over 20 years. That's expensive, right? So in this particular community, you can't see it because my fonts are off, it says 378, so they're about twice as big as you, 378 million over a 20 year period, okay, so cut that in half. You guys are paying about 200 million over a 20 year period. So the question is, can you build a fiber network throughout your city or your county for 200 million? Okay, so what's expensive is to continue to send $70 a month to Philadelphia, because that's where the money's going if you're a Comcast customer, for the next 20 years. So the, the question is, can we do it different, just assuming that's our budget. Let's assume we're gonna keep the internet for the next 20 years. Can we do it different uh, with a different model? Well, it's even worse than paying for so I'm paying $69 a month free internet service. I'm paying uh, uh, $160 a month for cell service, and I'm paying uh, $70 a month for uh, cable TV or, or uh, uh, satellite. And all of that is what you've got to add up. So just imagine, on your point, so nobody's even thinking about this. Just imagine if the cities 
throughout the country own the infrastructure. Cities are partnering with you to own the infrastructure. And everything's open to innovation. What happens to the cost of my cell service? What happens to the cost of cable TV? What happens to whatever you're consuming across the network? If everything's exposed to innovation, do we keep this static situation that we're in, or does everything start to change? Everything starts to change, right? If the base infrastructure's fiber, and it's all open to innovation. So this is what happened in Ammon. This is the first network we did. The price was 93 in Ammon. Cable One was the provider. Everybody had data caps. So they were down around 75, but everybody had data caps. So when we went out and surveyed, what people were actually paying was 93 as an average with the data caps. We implemented our system and just, just competition. It's just, you can switch your ISP. There were four ISPs on the system. The price dropped to 46.49, and the speed went from 30 by five, the average speed went from 30 by five to 1,000 by 1,000, okay? We cut it in half, the price, and the speed, you know. And if we want to upgrade above 10, uh, one gig, you have to change your electronics. You don't have to change the fiber. Now, who actually owned the fiber network in this example? And who paid? Is that 46 49 include the price of the fiber network? And who, who ended up owning the fiber network? So the city does, but let me show you. That's a great question. So in our model, this is your, an answer to your question. There's three expenses. There's the infrastructure, which is the fiber, the ongoing ma maintenance and operation of the network, M and O, and it's important that we keep them separated, and then there's services. So let's just talk about ISP services, okay? So the infrastructure expense was $3,000 per premise in Ammon, and it's buried. So it's not aerial, it's buried network, 3,000 per home. And when you finance that over 20 years, it actually turned out to be 17 bucks a month. Okay, so we've, we've rounded up to 20. The maintenance and operations is 1650 a month per subscriber. So they're paying the city to operate the network. And then the ISP, it's hard to see it with my fonts got thrown off. But the ISP for a gig is now $9.99. So the total is 46, this includes the fiber optics. Gig symmetrical, you're not sharing with your neighbors, it's not up to, it's gig symmetrical. There's an ethernet network, not a pond network. And what was the density of the housing in this example? So it's a city of 17,000 and it's, it's neighborhoods. So it's not as, some of your county is more spread out than this city. There, there's 300 feet between every house on my street. So <laughs> in my son's houses, we've got thousands of feet to deal with. So it's a, it's a relevant point, but I can show you a spreadsheet where if we go from $3,000 to $4,000 and then spread that cost over 20 years, it just goes up six bucks a month. So a thousand more per premise infrastructure cost when you spread it, so if you spread it over 30 years, it's gonna be more like four bucks a month. So we could finance it. Right now you're a renter, and you're gonna pay infrastructure forever. You're never gonna pay off. In this model, you can pay off, you could write a check tomorrow and pay off that $20 line item. So you could write a $3,000 check, and then you've only got two line items. So the residents are owners in that sense. They're owners in the sense that they can pay off their infrastructure. One more question, then you might. And I also think it's important to note that um, when those owners, the, the people who are at the premise, they're paying that off, who controls that transport layer is a democratically operated institution. It's the city. So voters get to decide things like, you know, are we going to go to the next area? There's policy involved as opposed to you know, things that are happening in a black box where you don't know really what's going on. 
Yeah, all network, all network decisions become policy decisions, and you're, you do at least have access to the people making those policy decisions. Okay, so what we're saying here, if you, if you go, cities can do this one of two ways. They can say, we're, this is a utility, it's essential infrastructure, we're just gonna build it to every premise. We're just gonna treat it like sewer and water, we're gonna build to every premise. That's the least expensive way to do it. You're forcing people to do it. They don't have a choice. You don't have to force them to subscribe to the maintenance and operation, and you don't have to force them to subscribe to the ISP services, but one model is you just build to everybody, and that ends up being the least expensive way to do it. And, and if you finance it over 30 years, you're getting the cost down per month to like 12 bucks in this scenario. So you'd propose if a county was approving a subdivision, then that they would actually require that fiber optic be laid within the subdivision as part of the actual infrastructure that's created. And that so Steve should be pushing for changes in codes right now. And the reason I would, I mean, in that particular case, it's going to be 800 bucks a month. If, they're, if the roads are open and their ditches are open, you're looking at probably 800 bucks per premise instead of 3,000. So does this end up on your property tax bill? Yeah, so do, the, the legal structure is different in different, in Ammon it ended up on the property tax bill for the infrastructure. Different jurisdictions handle it different ways. In Massachusetts, it's a betterment. It ends up. Because if you're gonna build out the whole community, you, you don't have much choice. You gotta yeah. put it on the property. Yeah, so that's one option is you do it there. The second option is you do this opt-in model where you just let people choose to opt-in. It ends up driving up the cost for everybody. So the higher the take rate, the lower the cost. But then you're not forcing people to do it. You're just letting people opt-in. So if you have drawn a line and you've said, well, this is as far as we're going to go with our plan, and somebody in the more rural area says, well, I, I want in, yeah. but you're not part of the initial plan, how does that work? So we actually have a model here in Nevada County. Uh, we have a water district, NID, and NID, uh, it, where I live, uh, I think it's seven years ago now, special election, um, special district uh, was set up to see if we wanted uh, water, and we voted it in. And so for the privilege of having water brought to my house, I pay $2,000 a year over a 10-year period on top of paying my water bill. 2000 per year, part of my property tax. So that's twenty. You know, that's twenty thousand dollars I paid for having water infrastructure put into my house. So that model's here in this county. There is no reason why that couldn't be replicated. And they could have thrown fiber in the trench if they were thinking. So w what happens if in 15 or 20 years some new innovation comes along that's better than fiber and you've got all this? I mean, that's just very speculative, of course. Well, there's two ways to look at that question. Um, one way is the way you do. What if a new technology? Another way to look at it, though, is will your demands as a consumer outpace the capacity of fiber in 20 years? <laughs> So yeah, I mean, that may be the case. That's not true for everybody, right? You also own a conduit in the ground and you can pull something else through. Right. Yep. Yeah. yeah, the conduit's the expensive part. But I would argue that even for the younger people in this room, the capacity of fiber is going to exceed our lifetimes. Sure. So it, it may, might become an issue for our children or our grandchildren. It's not going to become an issue for us. The capacity is already way beyond what we're going to consume. Yeah. Yeah. So, other questions? Does any of this enhance cybersecurity? So, I mean, that's a, that's a really broad question. I think what it does is it allows, when you've got an open system that people can innovate on, then people can innovate in all areas, right? 
We're, none of us can innovate on the Comcast system. Comcast does that. Nobody can innovate on the AT&T system. And so the earlier slides that I ripped through, one of them says open systems enable evolution to happen at a much faster pace. So the point is to encourage innovation to happen and to provide this, this really important foundation, which is our core infrastructure, to be exposed to that. All right, any questions on this business model? So the key points are you're already spending the money. The money's already, so the, the city or the county doesn't need a new budget item that's new for everybody. You're already writing the check. It's just a matter of how the money flows. And with this system, so in Ammon, for those who have paid off their infrastructure, they're paying $26 a month for gig symmetrical connectivity. 26 bucks. The bulk who have not, they're paying 46 bucks, but that's still a, a significant change off of $70 a month. Somebody asked earlier, well, what if Comcast just drops their price? But we know that game, right? We know that's not a permanent change. We know they're going to drop the price to kill the network, and once the competition goes away, the price goes back up, right? Because we've seen that. We know that's what's going to happen. But if you commit to your infrastructure, you commit to paying your infrastructure, the number they've got to compete against now is $26 forever. Okay. So the key thing is get people to commit as a community, get a robust network, and then have advanced technologies on top of the operation of that network so the new stuff can happen. So this is Bruce Patterson. He's the really, he's our partner in Ammon. He said, we need the community to own the wire to make it easy for service providers to come and compete across that wire in an open marketplace. That will dramatically change the price across the country. So I don't disagree with you that fiber sounds expensive, but in reality, what's expensive is, is for the community not to do this. That's what's expensive. Because you're going to end up paying $70 a month until some competitive pressure changes that, and there's not one on the horizon other than a community-owned network or a city-owned network. And that's 70 yep. That's what happens with monopolies. Monopolies get worse over time, right? And in their case, their monopoly is protected by the infrastructure and by their lobbying efforts, which are immense. So, yeah. City council did. It's not, it wasn't a citywide vote. It was just city council made the decision. But they're not forcing people to do it, right? So if you, if you were going to force everybody to take it, that may have to go to a vote. But in this case, it's opt-in. So if people don't want to participate, don't participate. But they're still going to build They are. Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah. is what the uh, cable company. Ammons built... Ammons built the infrastructure, so they know that everybody will come on. In fact, Cable One went to them and said, we have an 80% market share, and we know we will lose it all. We know we'll lose it all to your network, even though it's opt-in. Okay? So we're out of time. Yeah. One important point I just wanted to mention as he's been talking about this, there hasn't been too much discussion. The whole idea of gig symmetrical, huge for Nevada County. Every, all of us who have non-cable internet, I have to come into this office to upload any video. I have to come into town to do anything that needs more than like a couple megs upload speed. So that's more than the cost and everything, it's creating a level playing field. Too. It's really a big deal for, particularly for small business. I, I think it's a big deal for a lot of people, but for a small business, it's a big deal to have a symmetrical network. Yeah. So other questions? I don't want to take more of your evening than you've offered. Any other questions about any of this? Kind of off the point, Ammon near Boise? Ammon's the other side of the state. So we are doing a project in Mountain Home, which... Oh, okay. Yeah, it's right next to Idaho Falls. We are doing a project in Mountain Home, mm -hmm. 
which is near Boise, and then up the canyon in McCall, which is a ski resort town. Yeah, we're doing a project there. But what the argument they make is this is the domain of the private sector. And so they don't distinguish. See, we're able to say, OK, are you a service provider or are you an infrastructure provider? They want to have it both ways. They want to be both the infrastructure provider and the service provider. We say this is a natural monopoly, the infrastructure. We only need one fiber connection. There's enough capacity in one fiber connection. It's a natural monopoly. And then, yes, let's make the services open to competition, push them all to the cloud. So yeah, that, but I, we don't worry too much about that because it's going to become an economic development issue. California has cleared the path for cities to do this. You explicitly have the ability to do it. Um, you, could, you could even be the ISP under California law. So here it's not an issue. It, it tends to be a red-blue where that argument of it's a private sector thing has resonated in red states. Um, Connecticut's the one exception, which is the headquarters of some of the cable companies. Other questions? OK, so basic message is we can deliver fiber optics in this community, even to the more rural parts of the community, for, for significantly less than you're going to pay over the next 20 to 30 years. And so it really becomes a political will issue, people getting educated and creating the political will to do it. OK, thanks for coming. Thanks for your time. <laughs>